When we look at all the properties of a gas at the same time, we come up with a relationship known as the ideal gas law. To start with, let's do a quick little review of kinetic molecular theory. We said kinetic molecular theory was a way for us to explain a lot of things that gases do. So gas particles are much smaller than the spaces between them. Gases are mostly empty space. Um, Second part, gas particles are constantly moving and experience elastic collisions with other particles and the walls. Uh, that's why gases fill their container, right? No matter how big the container is, a gas will fill it. Uh, the velocity of the gas particles is proportional to the temperature of the sample. Uh, that's kind of just the definition of kinetic energy, so we're good there. And uh, finally, attractive and repulsive intermolecular forces are negligible. Again, remember, they don't go away. They're just negligible because of the distance between the particles and the speed, uh, the kinetic energy with which the particles are moving. So here we've got the ideal gas law. The volume of a sample of gas is directly proportional to the amount and temperature of the sample and inversely proportional to the pressure. So here's our proportionality. Volume is proportional to NT over P. We can convert that to an equality by adding a constant. V is equal to K and T over P. And because this one gets used generally and, uh, and more widely, uh, we're going to rearrange that a little bit just so we don't have a division um, because that's awkward to, to write in, uh, in text. And our K, our constant, is just going to be a specific constant for this type of a problem. So the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT. Um, we're going to use that a whole lot in a bunch of different ways. So uh, just a quick example. A sample of gas contains 12.192 grams of helium at 22.36 degrees C and 1.016 atmospheres. What is the volume of this sample? PV equals NRT. We've got all of our pieces here. Let's start plugging in. Uh, pressure is in the problem. Volume is what I'm looking for. Moles. Well, this is one of those things I need to know. It's helium so that I can convert grams to moles. But there we go, moles. And let's jump over here for just a second. Temperature. Um, again, make sure that we're using Kelvin temperature because we need an absolute temperature scale. What about R? We use R in a number of places, um, and almost all of the R's that we end up using are conceptually the same R, but they have different units. So when we're doing a gas law problem, we want an R that reflects those units that we're using. And in addition to that, in a gas law problem, make sure that you use R to set up the rest of your units and the, and the rest of your problem. So the value of R that we're going to use for most ideal gas law problems is 0 0.08206 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin. So that value of R, that constant, tells you all of the correct units to use. Your volume needs to be in liters. Your pressure needs to be in atmospheres. Your amount needs to be in moles. Your temperature needs to be in Kelvin. So this is another place where keeping track of the units and actually explicitly going in and writing out all of your units can be really helpful in making sure you're setting a problem correctly. So there we've got it. Plug all those numbers in. You should come out with 72.69 liters as the volume of this sample of gas. Now, because this is an ideal gas law, um, because this applies to a lot of things, we've got R, we've got this constant, which applies to a lot of different samples. That's why R, you know, in, in the simple gas laws, we had this K that we kind of just ditched real quick because the values of K were gonna change too much. But now we've got R that doesn't change, or at least doesn't change within the context of the problems that we're typically gonna be doing. That doesn't mean we can't make a comparative form of the ideal gas law. So if we're in a situation where we're looking at a changing condition, we're looking at how conditions change, we can craft a, 
comparative form of the ideal gas law, which gets rid of R completely. So we've got P1 V1 over N1 T1 equals P2 V2 over N2 T2. Um, if you keep this one in mind, any time we want a simpler gas law, all we have to do is cover up the conditions that don't change. So, and for example, if the number of moles and the temperature are held constant, you can cover up that whole bottom section and you get Boyle's law, P1 V1 equals P2 V2. So the comparative ideal gas law really contains all of the other gas laws in it. So let's take a look at a question. This is another weather balloon problem. This time we've got a leaky weather balloon. Um, so a weather balloon is filled to a volume of 76.706 liters with 3.183 moles of helium at 1.016 atmospheres of pressure and 298.37 Kelvin. Um, as it is released, a small leak forms and the balloon loses 0.813 moles of helium as it rises to an altitude where the pressure is 0.9281 atmosphere and the temperature is 268.34 Kelvin. What's the volume of the balloon? Just to make this um, fit a little bit easier on the page, I went ahead and just talked about it in terms of moles and Kelvin um, so we didn't have to do that extra conversion. But there we go. We've got an ideal gas law problem where we've got changing conditions, we can use the comparative form of the ideal gas law and just start plugging in. Again, one of the one of the big challenges isn't really using it, it's just making sure that you're picking out condition one and condition two in your problem and making sure that you keep them uh, correctly matched up. So there are all the values from the problem plugged in to that. Again, we, we're losing, so we've got to take a, take a difference here. Um, but if you work that out, the math should give you 56.23 uh, liters as your final answer. If we're talking about ideal gas law, we probably should talk about when do gases not behave ideally. So a non-ideal gas, or these are often referred to as real gases, um, but gases behave ideally when they exactly obey kinetic molecular theory of gases, right? So there are my kinetic molecular theory of gases uh, points just copied from the previous slide. The important thing to think about here is when would a gas behave not ideally? And there are two important conditions where gases tend to deviate from ideal behavior. The first of those is high pressure. So if I increase the pressure. What am I doing? I'm pushing the gas particles closer together. If I'm pushing them closer together, at some point the space between the particles is no longer going to be much larger than the size of the particles. So I'm going to start violating this first point in uh, kinetic molecular theory. Once those distances between get smaller, now some of the intermolecular forces are going to start to kick in. They're going to be able to start to be felt between the particles because they're so close together. Even if they've got a lot of kinetic energy, when the particles are pushed close enough together, they'll start to feel some of those intermolecular forces. The other condition where gases tend to deviate from ideal behavior is at low temperature. Uh, if we think about temperature, temperature is just a measure of kinetic energy. And as we decrease the temperature, as we go to a very low temperature, kinetic energy decreases. And as kinetic energy decreases, at some point, the kinetic energy is no longer large enough for us to say that the intermolecular forces are negligible. So high temperature, low pressure are places where we get in trouble. And to be fair, let's think about this. In the real world, let's start with low temperature. What happens when I um, take a sample of gas and I lower the temperature? Well, eventually it condenses to a liquid. Well, a liquid is not an ideal gas, right? So if, I, if gases were always ideal no matter what, there would be no liquid. So low temperature, gets me to a phase change, phase change is non-ideal gas. Similarly with high pressure, this one, uh, 
this one we've got probably a little less direct uh, experience with, but um, if you take a gas and you put it under pressure, what can happen to it? Well, uh, if you've got a uh, if you've got a, a grill, if you've got a fish house heater, um, you might use uh, propane, and that tank of propane has slosh it around. It's got liquid propane in it. It's LP gas, liquid propane. But as soon as you open that up and you decrease the pressure, propane is actually a, a gas. So high pressure can lead to, again, a phase change. So high pressure and low temperature are where gases deviate from ideal behavior. They're also the conditions where gases tend to condense to form liquids. So um, look out for that when you're, when you're trying to use ideal gas ideas with gases that are maybe at a very high pressure or a very low temperature or both. Ideal gas law is is kind of the uh, the catch-all of, of equations that we would use for figuring out how gases are behaving. Um, it's got a lot of advantages, um, but it's not always the final answer. Some of those simple gas laws are just a little bit easier to use in context. So uh, make sure you get some practice in on these and I will see you next time.